Yes, yes, it's a good question. She said that was a long time. Is this in the board of two? Yeah. Yeah. My wife complains that I wave my hands all the time, so I would rather have this one in front of me instead of hitting myself with a hand mic. But you can hear me back there, right? No. All right. I'm forced to do it then. Uh, I'm going to make some outrageous statements, probably. Uh, I hope I can support them uh, as we go through this. Uh, but what you're seeing is a product of almost 45 years of research on the Continental Army and transferring it to the partisan warriors that served under Francis Marion. And part of my, my problem with giving a, a presentation to this group is that you are all Marion people, and Marion was a partisan, although he held the Continental Commission. And his men were partisans. And my main emphasis has been on the main force regular U.S. troops. And so this is sort of a, uh, a deviation from where I usually research. And this caused me to reevaluate a whole bunch of things. Uh, so bear with me. Now, I started with trying to understand Francis Marion's camps. And Steve Smith dragged me around, and uh, we dodged in between flooded waters and couldn't get to Snow's Island because Snow's Island was almost uh, underwater at the time. But we saw a lot of uh, proposed sites, and I'll come back to them. But if you start with a known site, and you're looking for camps, and you're also looking at a battlefield, you have a whole series of uh, assumptions that have to be made about what might be there. But before you even do that, are you in the right place? And Cowpens is pretty well documented as being the right place. Uh, I mean, the, the veterans held uh, reunions or celebrations there on a regular basis, even as late as the 1840s. They were still there uh, talking about what they had done during the battle. But Calpens is, is interesting because it's not just a battlefield and it's not just a place where people came together to uh, gather up their, their cattle on an annual basis before they drove it north to Philadelphia. It's also what a, a, a term that I created trying to explain something in other sites in North Carolina and South Carolina. It, that is, it was a geographic land uh, site that was sort of a, a mailbox or an address where if you were heading with messages to go to somebody, you could go to these way stations where you, if the person you were looking for was not there, you were very likely to be able to find somebody who could tell you where they were. Uh, Hanging Rock is another one, High Rock Ford in North Carolina. Uh, these sort of places were known to everybody locally so they could at least point you in the right direction if they were on the same side as you. It also was well known for the cattle roundups and there were, we had known occupations. That is, there were lots of times that we could document sizable groups of military people who went there and spent at least one night there. And there are at, at least five of them are germane for what we're talking about here. The Georgia refugees passed through there. Ferguson went right after them and camped there as well. On his way back, on his way to, Cal uh, to Kings Mountain, he stopped there again. The Over Mountain men stopped there. And then Morgan stopped there. But in the time that Morgan was at uh, Pacolet, uh, at Grindle Shoals, he had a steady stream of people who were coming down to uh, his camp, either carrying uh, uh, supplies or coming to join his uh, forces. And those men almost invariably camped at Cowpens because it's about uh, 25 miles away. And most of uh, the reinforcements that Morgan was getting in 1781, before the Battle of Cowpens, were mounted. 
that it, the partisan militia invariably was on horseback and Green and Morgan constantly bemoaned the fact that they were because this necessitated them moving on a fairly regular basis because they had to feed the horses. It wasn't so much feeding the men, they had to feed the horses and horses took an unbelievable amount of food that was also uh, seasonal in nature and it was very bulky. And so this made it uh, difficult to keep them well supplied. The battle was not in the camp. So the camp should be separated and should be identifiable. And the reason that the camp should be identifiable, if the battle isn't there, there should be a different kind of assemblage of material. But, what, but all of these other camps went to the Calpans and camped there because there were six springs. Whoops. Three on this side of the road and three on this side of the road. And those provided water. That's why they camped there. There was also, depending on the season, uh, a fair amount of forage in the for, uh, form of uh, grasses, or more importantly, pea vines. Pea vines grow up along with, in, and around cane breaks, and they're a primary winter forage for cattle in the Colorado and backcountry. And so this made this place important for feeding the animals that are accompanying the army. All right. If the battle is not in the camp and we look at the bullets that are coming off the site, they should reveal distinct lines. And if you look here, there is a line of bullets here, and there's somewhat of a line here. But then you have this area with three little lines of bullets here in an area that is traditionally thought to be Morgan's camp. Uh, I'm not convinced of that, and in fact, I would argue that Morgan's men camped all over the place, as is their want. And in fact, John Eager Howard says that they did, were dispersed enough because they were spread out wherever they felt like they wanted to camp. And this made it impossible to rapidly de assemble and deploy them uh, if they had to conduct a retreat, something that people who criticized Morgan for fighting here have not really considered. So where are the camps? And this is on the site where we have at least five known camps with, men, with the number of men exceeding 500. We have no evidence for these camps. And this is within the space of a one perimeter road of the National Park Service on this known battlefield. Presumably, these camps are in there. Uh, in the case of the Continentals, I think that on each of the roads that went in this network, they had one of their five companies blocking that road that, it, as they went out in the star form around it, that this would protect the main body of the militia that were inside. I uh, can't vouch for that. Uh, there's some indication in some of the pension documents that if you read into it something, it may be there. And now having said that, reading into something, we've heard a lot of questions raised about what somebody really said or what they meant. And I'm going to quote Thomas Pension, who's a sort of an exotic kind of uh, fiction writer. Uh, he wrote a book called V, and he wrote one about the V-2 rocket the end of the collapse of Germany at the end of World War II. That one was called Gravity's Rainbow, but it's notable for one thing to me, besides all the little trivia that he throws out about the V2, is that he had parables for paranoids. <laughs> and the first of these parables were that you hide, they seek. Okay? The second one was that if you get them asking the wrong questions, you don't have to worry about answers. And then the third one was even paranoids have real enemies. <laughs> but 
The second one is the important one because if we don't know precisely what we're asking of the written data or the archaeological data, any questions that we are asking because we're not sure about what we're doing, the answers may be totally irrelevant. And in fact, they may be very surprising. Whoops. This is a, a clarification. You see the same map. But the problem with the cow pens is that it's a management site. It's a place that was plopped down as a park on top of an existing little community. And if any of you went there in 75 or 76, uh, Charles, that is 1975, not 1775, <laughs> that you might have seen the landscape completely different from what it is today. And the, the way that the tree cover and things are is it constricts your view of the battlefield. And this is one of the roadways that was cannibalized and done away with when the park went and restored, restored it to its original appearance. And it is not the original appearance, but it has affected our view of the battlefield. So if you look at the battlefield in LIDAR, this is of particular importance if you're trying to find a site that you're not sure precisely where it is, but you have a good idea and you know something about the landscape as described by participants. This bare earth view of that same battlefield is really important. And we'll use the grape shot. As, so you have your reference points. And it's irrelevant where the trees are here. And if the air, ground cover was different today from what it was in the past, this takes care of that because it shows the ground surface. And there's a number of things that are very interesting. Look at all these little terraces here and back here. And this was a trailer park at one point. But these terraces, and you can see some of them, here's a visitor center, and as you walk across that landscape, you can see these today. This is the parking lot. But as you go through there, you look at it, and I wrote a book on the Battle of Cowpens, and I wrote that book as an archeological preface. That is, it was designed to guide archeological research. And so, it had a lot of uh, really, incredible details, but it, it wouldn't answer some of the questions. And then I was told certain things by experts uh, who, who supposedly really knew what they were talking about. And my goal when I was excavating in August of uh, 2015 was I wanted to find something related to the battle. And so over the course of three weeks plus, uh, conducting a metal detector survey there. Uh, my sum total of contribution to that battlefield was a 12-pack of Miller light beer cans, one crushed can at a time. And digging them out of that rock-hard soil, those uh, loams that get hard when they dry out, was really frustrating. In the meantime, people all around me were finding really neat stuff. And it was driving me insane, Tate, you're one of them. The, and it was incredibly frustrating. But one of the places where we found this, you don't get the impression because of the jumble, but this area here had been terraced. And every time I was assigned a lane to run, it was a lane where the soil, the topsoil had been moved to make these terraces. And so there was nothing there, it was sterile soil. Meantime, guys on both sides of me were finding uh, rifle balls and musket balls and things like that. And it just got you know, murmur, murmur, getting angrier and angrier and more and more frustrated. Uh, at the same time, I was learning a lot about the battlefield. And for, if you're going to look for things like uh, at Schubert's plantation, uh, John, getting an image like this, 
may really clarify what you're what you're trying to say about the battlefield. And the same thing if you're trying to define a battlefield on another site, an image of this coupled with where archaeological materials are found will really change your view of that landscape. And for us, here is the the Green River Road. This is where the golf skirmishers were and retreated back this way. Well, here, this is the open field, but this is a cluster of artifacts that's all over the place, and they include dropped British balls and, and fired high-velocity and low-velocity uh, militia and or Continental Army balls. So something happened here, and this goes back to the parable in, in reading uh, John Eager Howard, he, he said, well, the British Dragoons rode, rode back the way they had come and they were pursued, and the companies on our left, on, on the third line, fired at them as they went by. Well, these were Virginia militia, long service Virginia militia from Rockbridge County, Virginia on the left flank. And these guys were called the Rockbridge Rifles, which is a point that I'll, that I'll come back to again later. But the Rockbridge Rifles almost certainly were not armed with rifles, despite their name. Because two of them say that when we got to Hillsboro, we were issued guns. And no self-respecting rifleman would ever call his rifle a gun. Okay, and it, do you all understand the distinction between a rifle and a gun, or a rifle and a musket? Nobody's answering yes, so I'm going to presume that nobody really gets it. A rifle has grooves that are inserted, are carved into the metal of the inside of the barrel, and they're done in a spiral fashion, so that as a bullet transits through the barrel under the force of the gunpowder explosion, it imparts a spin to the bullet. And rifles in the 18th century were patched that is, they had a piece of uh, cloth that was greased, and it engaged the grooves and also acted as a uh, gas seal so that most of the force of the uh, gunpowder's charge was directed to driving the bullet. What happens when this occurs is that the bullet takes a spin from the rifling, is gyroscopically stabilized, and the rifles, because of the gas seal, are the bullets are probably traveling at supersonic speeds. That's why they crack instead of having a thunk as they go by. And they are far more accurate and have longer range. Okay, a, a musket is a smoothboard weapon. It's like a shotgun, there are no grooves in it. And I'll come back to that and talk about that in a second. If you look at the combat weapons, and for those of you who have taken the time to look at John's collection of material from uh, Quimby and uh, Schubrick's back there, you can see the bewildering collection of material uh, that's made out of lead and is, is or was once round. The Continental Army, after about 1778, was gradually totally armed with French weapons. And these were 69 caliber, and I find it really interesting that there are a bunch of uh, French Charlottesville musket parts there in that collection from Quimby and Schubrick's. The state troops that fought with Morgan, I think that the, the South Carolina state troops probably had uh, a mix of French and British and personal weapons. And the personal weapons could be almost anything. The Virginia uh, state troops that uh, fought on the third line with the Continentals almost certainly had 69 caliber French weapons. The militia, South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, and Virginia, uh, with the exception of the third line people, had a mix of 75 British, 69 French and rifles. Now, 
the rifles, of the, and you can see some of the material back there uh, is a, 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 a interesting collection of sizes. And the rifles were personal weapons in most cases, and they had a range at the time of the Battle of Cowpens or the Revolutionary War that was roughly from 50 to 60, 62 hundredths of an inch. And most of them, based on French and Indian War sites and Revolutionary War sites, are in the range of about uh, 54 caliber. The British, on the other hand, had pretty well standardized their weaponry. Most of it was uh, uh, 75 caliber brown vessels, including ones that were made in Holland to British specs, but were second second tier weapons. Uh, the British dragoons could have had uh, British carbines, or they could have had cut down brown vessels uh, that were 75 caliber, and they almost certainly had 65 caliber British pistols. And there's a range of those as a probability. The, the British provincials, the Prince of Wales uh, American Regiment, and the British Legion could have had 75, and I think that's probably true across the board. But after the Battle of Camden, a lot of British militia units in South Carolina were, re -ish were issued, because now they, they turned out in some numbers after the Battle of Camden, and the British decided to trust them, and they gave them weapons that had been captured at the Battle of Camden. And this one regiment of uh, militia, that as soon as they were issued their, uh, their captured uh, American or and weaponry that was French in origin, immediately deserted and went over to the American side again. Uh, but that tells us that the provincials could have 69 caliber uh, uh, weaponry. The artillery had, uh, if they didn't have British carbines, had 75 caliber British muskets. If you look at that table, you can see everything that I've just mentioned is represented there in one bore size or another. And we can tell this from the weight of the bullets as well as from the established bore diameter. 